Hey there, Hurley Burleyites. As COVID-19 drags and drags and drags on, we've had to get creative with our podcast. And I'm not talking about stuff like which arcane illustrator will Scott Reed's superhero t-shirt pay tribute to this week, but how we actually completely changed how we produce this show. Four remote locations, digital connectivity, non-coffee slurping microphone yeti quality, that kind of thing. The pandemic has spurred countless stories of creativity, resilience, and digital connectivity all across the country as Canadians pivot their lives and work online. Our presenting sponsor, TELUS, is sharing a number of these, particularly from small business owners who needed to get creative fast to maintain their livelihoods. Neil Zeller is a professional photographer who, like countless business owners, watched his entire client base evaporate in a single day. But Neil wasn't one to sit around helplessly. Instead, he completely reimagined his product and created portraits. And what started as an idea to save his own business has become a nationwide project. Here's how it works. Photographers meet with people outside their homes where they do a full professional photo shoot through windows from the front porch, driveway, lawn, or balcony, strictly adhering to the self-distancing rules in the emergency public health order. Hundreds of photographers from Iqaluit to Battleford and beyond are taking part. Zeller himself has done hundreds of these shoots. More recently, in production in partnership with TELUS, Neil expanded portraits to showcase their local small business owners who have stayed open during the pandemic to support their local economies. To learn more about how Canadians are using digital connectivity to reinvent their lives during COVID, visit connectingcanadaforgood.ca. All right, my fine Hurley Burleyites, I have a personal announcement to make. On Sunday, I turned 58 years old, despite my best efforts. And despite the fact that Scott Reed posted on Twitter that I was 127 years old. And then he went on Instagram, where he posted that I was 131 years old. So he aged me four more years in the time it took him to thumb type from one social platform to another. If you work at Sun Life and have anything to do with setting rates or compliance on my life insurance, please do not be grossly misled by Scott's tweets in the way that so many of our previous liberal leaders and prime ministers have been misled by Scott before you. I'm 58 years old, I'm gloriously healthy, and I can easily walk down ramps and drink water with one hand. It's another COVID double feature this week, a two-part podcast of all that is pandemical and pertinent. Part one, we welcome Dr. Jennifer Robson to the pod. Jennifer is an associate professor of political management at Carleton University, where she teaches in public policy and research methods. Her own research addresses social and tax policy, inequality and poverty in Canada, and public administration. We're going to talk about what else, the COVID economy, and what it's going to look like for us from here on out. In part two of the pod, it's the occasionally bickering, ever-loving political panel with Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed. We'll pick up on the Robson conversation, plus we'll get more granular about COVID reopening and its implications. We'll talk about the upcoming conservative leadership debates and what kind of must-see TV that's going to be. The role of policy in leadership races, hint, not much. Plus, Trump's firing up the old rally machine on June 20th, and everyone is welcome to attend as long as you sign your liability waiver so he can't be held accountable in the event you get sick and die. Fun times in Trump town. All right. Jennifer, thank you for coming on our show. Thank you for for being here. Thanks for having me, and happy belated birthday. 58 years young. Thank you for. Oh my God, it's so old. It's terrible. No. Um, (laughs) Well, thank you. You're kind. Uh, I start, ever since the pandemic has started, I start by asking my guests to start off with, how are you? What are your circumstances personally, and how have you been managing through this whole thing? You okay? Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a great question to be asking. I think we should all be asking each other that. Um, So I've been working from home um, with my three kids and my partner. Um, You know, we're we're one of the lucky families in that um, our kids had uh, lots of support to be able to transition to online learning. I'm not saying it's been fun. Um, and, you know, I was already used to working from home a lot of the time, not really used to working from home with everybody else home, but, you know, we're figuring it out. And my husband and I are both really lucky in that um, none of our 
and none of our pay was interrupted. We didn't lose paid hours. We didn't lose any income, right? So I'm just sort of keenly aware of any time that I feel kind of, you know, upset about not being able to go on vacation this summer. I just remember how crappy it is for so many other uh, people across the country and so many other families. Um, you know, I think we're all doing the best we can. Are you worried about the impact of this period of time on your children? Like the either the yeah. educational aspect of it or the social aspect of it? Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, so I've got two teenagers and a, uh, a nine-year-old. And, um, you know, they're all coping really well. But it's a crappy thing to have to cope with. Like my eldest is supposed to be, well, she is graduating from high school and starting uh, university in the fall. And that whole transition and journey is not going the way that she had been planning and hoping for. You know, um, the, the other teenager really misses hanging out with her friends. The nine-year-old uh, was saying just the other day, she would like to spend time with somebody who is not an immediate family member and to see one of her friends not through a video screen again, right? Like, so there's that whole, you know, in as much as like their education is moving forward and that's fine and they're healthy, thank goodness. There's that whole aspect of like social development and friendships that they're, they've had to put on pause. And I worry about what that's going to mean. Like kids are resilient if they've got the right supports, but not infinitely so. Right. Well, good luck with that. And Thank you. Hopefully, uh, you'll get some. Uh, hopefully, you'll get some childcare help at some point. Um. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. And yeah. uh, you know, uh, there's always that future uh, bill for therapy that I'm sure yeah. I and other <laughs> parents will be thinking about. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you, I want to talk to you about the world that will emerge from COVID and the kind of economy and the kind of society you think will emerge and you think could emerge, because I don't know that anything is set in stone about what will emerge. There'll be discussions and debates and arguments about what should emerge. And yep. I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear your, pers I'd like to hear your perspective on that. Um, let's start with something that I don't know how to begin to discuss things without having any sense of what this is. Going forward, what is the fiscal anchor on public policy? If we don't have, if we don't say that money is finite in some degree, we can't make any choices at all. Um, so, so far we've given no indication of how finite money is. What is going to be the answer to that question? Yeah, that's a, oof, okay. If I knew the answer to that question, I would be a very wealthy woman. Um, so here's my take on it for what it's worth. I still think that the right metric to be using is the ratio of uh, debt to GDP. Um, and um, the tricky part comes in saying, what is, the, what is the maximum ratio that we are willing to tolerate? Mm -hmm. I think for a long time, um, you know, kind of economists believed um, that there was a, a way that you could figure out what that maximum rate was, um, that uh, there was a concern that certain forms of government uh, deficit spending would lead to inflation. It turns out that we found out in the financial crisis that didn't actually happen. Um, and I think we're now in a world, we've never experienced this before, where you have essentially all the economies of the world simultaneously needing to do def deficit spending and needing to raise capital and borrow, right? Uh, and we're also kind of at that point where interest rates have been historically so low for so long that they're effectively, I mean, in some respects, they're effectively negligible, right? Like we're kind of at that zero lower bound in terms of real interest rates now. So I think the answer is, I don't know. We do need some sort of recognition that yes, money is finite. There will be some upper limit on the willingness of, um, uh, of lenders to, uh, to buy up sovereign bonds. Uh, there is some notional limit of 
the ability of a central bank to just print money before bad things start to happen. But we're like in some weird upside down world where none of, none of our previous economic history, I think has really adequately prepared us for what we're in right now. So that's my long way of saying, yeah, we need one, but I don't know what it should be. Okay. But you're, you're advising the government, which I read and <laughs> how, how can they decide, for example, how long they can afford the CERB if they don't know the answer to that question? Yeah. So I think, and I, so I guess I should preface all of this by saying, yes, I, I did, as everybody read in the paper, um, as I learned others had read in the paper. Um, yes, I was invited to uh, talk to the prime minister on one stock take. And um, as uh, I think every academic who does public policy work would agree. Um, when the phone rings and a government asks for your help and advice, you're supposed to say yes, right? And it doesn't matter who the government is. Um, so that's kind of my perspective on that. Um, so it, trying to figure out how long they can afford to pay for CERB is one question. And I think perhaps the more pressing question that they've been really grappling with is how long will CERB be needed? Right, like how how long and how much does CERB need to pay out in order to keep us all afloat, and that's a more short term consideration. I don't think, I, I I don't think that we're yet in the world of being able to figure out um, all in what can we afford and how are we going to pay for all of this yet. To be perfectly frank, like I think the, the regular rules of public budgeting are a bit suspended right now. And what is the impact of the fact that the money is effectively free? So when I was getting a little conversant with these issues in the mid-1990s, advising the Department of Finance around the communications around budget yep. management and deficit reduction, as I understood, the crisis was entirely related to interest rates. That's why our debt to GDP ratio was unsustainable because the compound interest rating interest rates on that debt were going to consume everything left unchecked. But that was you know, an entirely different interest rate world. Now with money free, why is there a constraint? Why don't we blow our brains out? I mean, you think Great of all question. the things we'd like to do. You think of all the things we'd like to do. We'd like to transform the economy to be green. We'd like to make sure that we've got great long-term care homes for seniors. We mm -hmm. would like to have a pharma care program. Why can't mm -hmm. we? So there is still some notional upper bound, like I said before, on the willingness of um, international markets to buy up our debt. Right. One of the other so one of the other challenges that we faced in the 90s was that we were getting to a debt to GDP ratio such that so in addition to the interest rate effect, but such that um, also international investors were looking at Canadian sovereign bonds and saying, mm, not so sure, not so sure that's a safe investment anymore. Right. Not so sure they're actually going to be able to make good on on that that payment. Um, but that's in a that's in a competitive context. Right. Where Canada was looking to raise capital from international markets against other countries like Germany, uh, like Korea, like Japan, you know, um, who might have looked comparatively like better bets. Now, all of those same countries are also trying to raise money all at the same time. So like I said, like we're, it's, we're in some sort of crazy, like upside down world. And um, if the money, so if the money is, it's not ever actually truly free, but it's super low cost right now, right? Like we are talking about pennies on the dollar to do public deficit spending right now. However, um, that is true at the federal level. It's not quite true at subnational levels, right? And so I think another disciplinary perspective that we need to bring to bear on this is to remember that it's not just the federal government that we're talking about, that they are effectively gonna also be having to uh, do some work to help and carry uh, municipalities and also provinces as well. So I think it's low cost money, but it's not free. And the actual right. effective burden of the total debt that we are thinking about right now is probably a lot bigger than just what the feds are, are carrying. Okay. Thanks. Um, so 
I heard a lot of people say, and I read a lot of people say, <clears throat> especially during the initial stages of COVID, yep. that, my God, this was such an awakening for everybody about what the real values were in society and what was really important versus what we thought was important and how we'd valued everything wrong. I read a lot of people saying everything's going to be different when this is over and we're going to have a very different society. Is everything going to be different? Is anything going to be different as a result of this? Uh I think there are going to definitely be some things that are different. And actually, can I, can I use this actually just to go back one step to say that in addition to the fiscal picture, right, I think that that question around what do we, you know, oh, it's low cost or almost free money, we still have to make smart choices about how we spend it, right? And we do have choices about um, spending money that essentially just returns us to um, everything that we had before or the kinds of things that we knew how to do before, good and bad. Um, or we can make choices to, for example, if we're going to be spending gobs of money on infrastructure, we can choose to put in infrastructure that is actually more environmentally sustainable and greener, right? So we can make some of those smarter choices. I, okay, so I feel quite divided on this question of what's going to be different. Maybe it could all be like, maybe this is the moment that the revolution finally arrives because um, I think human nature being what it is, um, that there are some, uh, there is some wish to just get back to the way things were as quickly as possible, right? And that's a, that's a real tension against a recognition that um, for some people, this is not going to ever be a return back to normal. And let me give you one example uh, in the very short term. Um, and I don't really know quite how this is all going to play out yet. But as different jurisdictions are reopening and going through different phases, you know, here in, where I live in Ontario, we're now at phase two of, I don't know how many phases, but anyway, we're at phase two. Um, and those reopenings are taking place at very different paces for, di for people, depending on the sector that they work in, their gender, and whether or not they have kids. So one thing that could be very different if we don't think about this carefully and act accordingly, and I'm, I'm, all, I'm worried it's already a little too late in some cases, if we don't pay attention to making sure that families have access to childcare, then there's going to be a real decline in maternal labor market um, participation. And that in turn is gonna have a big impact on household incomes, which is gonna have a big impact on consumer demand it's and so that could actually be a transformative change in a way that I don't think we want, right? So, so just to be clear, as, are you just, yeah. just to be clear if I could, Jennifer, are you talking about yeah. a return to the availability of child care that we had pre COVID, or are you talking about some more expanded, much broader availability of child care because it was pretty limited before COVID? Yeah, it was imperfect before COVID. But now, even as childcare spaces are reopening, they're only able to open at like half capacity, right? So we're not even getting back to pre-COVID levels. And I don't see a clear path forward for an awful lot of childcare providers in order to get back to pre-COVID supply. And there's a real risk that some number of suppliers uh, or providers of childcare are actually going to go under. So it's one of those things of like just by effectively keeping the old policy framework and just saying, okay, child cares, you can, you can reopen now. We actually put them in a position where we could reverse progress and, and actually reduce our supply relative to what we had pre COVID. Um, do, do we need more child care supply, like even greater than what we had pre COVID? Yeah, that was true before COVID. That will be true after COVID. I think that COVID has highlighted exactly how constrained the supply was. <clears throat> The, um, how would you propose that we do this? I mean, I, I assume that what you're looking for, you've written extensively about this, and you've been one of the leaders on the she session and how we need to uh, focus on child care to get women back into the labor force, primarily to help the economy grow, although there's some personal aspects to that as well. Um, but I presume that you, I mean, when the Ford government popped up unexpectedly on a Monday and said childcare facilities could open on Friday, 
that's presumably not what you were looking for in terms of the plan for childcare. That's not actually a plan, right? That's, <laughs> yeah. So here's, if I had a magic wand and if uh, provincial governments were listening, because this is an area of provincial jurisdiction, uh, yeah, uh, just, you know, sounding, uh, sounding the gong and saying, okay, on your marks, get set, go. Uh, is not a plan. Mm -hmm. So what childcare providers I think need is uh, some immediate capital funding to be able to, um, first of all, re-equip the spaces that they have for the PPE that the new guidelines are going to um, require them to have, maybe doing some space adaptations, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, grocery stores don't look exactly the same as they used to, right? But grocery stores are profit-making uh, firms that can afford the cost of the plexiglass yeah. because they're going to recoup it, uh, you know, in consumer sales. Uh, How about childcare we save what grocery stores can and can't afford for later in the conversation? Okay, fair, fair, <laughs> fair. Because there's one thing it's pretty clear they could afford. Um, <laughs> so, so childcare providers, like they need that working capital right now in order to get their spaces ready in order to, um, uh, bring back staff that may have been laid off. Uh, and um, and most importantly, we have missed a golden opportunity um, to equip childcare providers to have satellite locations, right? So that we actually effectively get closer to the pre-COVID supply by having the same childcare provider work in more than one, like the same childcare um, agency, I'm not talking about individual care workers, but child care agency have more than one location so that like there's lots of empty spaces right now. Like there are empty schools and empty uh, community centers. Why are we not repurposing that so that actually more kids would have a space? You know, so right now, instead, we're in a world where, like I said, child care providers, the ones that are able to come back are going to be coming back with vastly reduced numbers. Um, and they're going to be facing some awful choices around, you know, which families actually get the spots, who pays for all of the extra costs that they're now facing. Um, and those are, those are for the lucky families and lucky providers that have actually been able to weather the storm. So there you go. There's a couple of free ideas if policymakers at provincial levels are listening. Um, and the theory that, you know, don't let a crisis go to waste. If you're a policy reformer, uh, and you focus yourself on poverty and inequality. Um, should we be using this as an occasion to try to dramatically change our society, or should we, or, or are we just doing battlefield surgery and we should just try to get back on our feet? So, I think that there are things that we could do that would actually be maybe incremental, but actually lead to pretty important and radical change. And they are not necessarily the things that a lot of uh, poverty activists might be focused on and thinking about, um, but it's things like, um, we should be changing the way that we actually run our tax system because huge parts of how we actually deliver income support and how people in poverty uh, get access to all kinds of other benefits, whether it's like housing subsidies or childcare subsidies or extended medical benefits, um, relies on our tax system. They got to file a tax return in order to prove that they're poor before we give them any help. Why, why are we doing that? Why are we creating a situation where people um, have to uh, take on that burden when actually governments already have the information on file, right, and could vastly simplify that process. You know, one of the big reasons um, that, remember, remember a couple of months ago, there was the big debate around, um, why are they making people apply for CERB? Why don't they just send everybody a check, right? Mm -hmm. It's because there's like, there's no mega The Bosenkuhl, the Bosenkuhl argument. Exactly. And Ken and I have yeah. talked extensively about this. But the fact of the matter is that um, by the time government would have cobbled together some kind of very incomplete, rough and outdated list, uh, most of the pandemic crisis would have been over. So what we can do is like that small little change would actually make a world of difference to millions of Canadians. And it would also have the added benefit of making us more resilient so that the next time we have a crisis, Right? We're actually better equipped to handle it. So there's one idea, one idea that we could do. So yeah, it's like, 
there are things that we could and should be doing in terms of how we, how we run things right now. Um, I'm a little anxious about proposing massive whole scale um, change to the social welfare programs because a lot of them have served us reasonably well. They have lots of flaws. So I also just kind of want to wait and see to find out. I don't think we're going to, whatever our new normal is. Okay, I'm a lay person. I'm I'm a lay person. I got to understand. I got to understand what you mean by that. Because my understanding um, from a very uninformed perspective would be that Medicare in this country, sorry, that welfare in this country, social welfare in this country, effectively ended with the 1995 budget. Um, and the con- ending of the Canada Assistance Plan transfers to the provinces um, and the lumping together of the transfer, which the provinces then spent, of course, all on health care and education and on, on welfare. So that's there's no effective welfare program in this country. And the second thing is that we don't have an unemployment insurance program. We used to, but we, don't, we have an unemployment insurance program that covers, what, 25, 30% of working people? Uh, so it's about, I think, 80% of working people that pay in, but out of all unemployed people, it's about 40-ish percent that actually are able to collect anything when they need it. Yep. Right. Okay. So, uh, and, and we'll become less so as the economy changes. So if we don't have EI and we don't have welfare, what do you consider to be a, a social welfare system that's serving us well? So... You are right that we do not have an effective or well-functioning social assistance uh, system in any jurisdiction across this country. I know that it is common uh, to attribute that to the 95 uh, budget changes and that removing um, removing the conditions on cap effectively gave uh, provincial governments license to gut uh, their, their spending. Uh, uh, and just make all of the systems far more punitive. Um, I would like to point out, though, that um, those those changes were made by governments of a whole bunch of different political stripes, right? Um, and so I find it a little bit difficult to say that if only um, a good federal government had stepped in and had the right kinds of values and imposed the right kinds of conditions, that provinces would have uh, would have complied and been kinder. Um, I think there was just a widespread zeitgeist at the time that might have happened, whether the federal uh, changes took place or not. On EI, yeah, we also eroded that program. The two big problems with each of those programs are that they um, they are effectively um, <laughs> they are effectively uh, in in some forms programs of last resort. If you're lucky enough, at least with EI, to be, uh, you know, part of the standard workforce that has worked enough hours and can navigate the system. Um, but there are examples, right? Like, for example, we have effectively reduced seniors' poverty in this country in the last 30 years from over 50% to under 5% for uh, seniors uh, living as couples and about 10%, 10 to 12% for seniors living alone. Still too high. Still too high, but it does show us that actually uh, we can put in place programs that make a real meaningful difference. Likewise, um, our system of child if benefits. If they have in a strong country. political constituency behind them. Yeah, but you know what? Child benefits like is seniors, another way. Like seniors do, and like welfare recipients do not. Welfare recipients do not. They have no voice whatsoever, and that is a huge problem. Um, but child benefits is another one where. Uh, we've actually made a real meaningful difference in terms of reducing poverty um, through through changes to how we run those systems and how much we're willing to invest. So there are things that we could do that would make welfare less stigmatizing, um, make it less punitive. Um, there are things that we could do that would mean that more people could actually get access to the AI system that they are already paying into. Um, and make it simpler to navigate. Um, And I am all in favor of doing those things that are like obviously good to do and would make sense, made sense before the pandemic, would make sense in this moment that we are right now and would probably serve us well going forward. Um, I am less certain about uh, just cancel EI, replace it with something else until I have a better sense of what our new normal is going to be, because we're not going to be there for a little bit, right? We're in this like liminal phase right now where we're trying to 
we're trying to just get our hands on the, the reopening. So yeah, that's why I kind of like this idea of like incrementalism. Your focus on, um, your focus is on both poverty and inequality, yeah. right? Yep. What's the difference between the two of them and which is the more serious problem in Canada? Sure. Okay. So, uh, poverty means, uh, living in some sort of state of deprivation relative to some kind of baseline. We now finally officially have a national poverty line, um, that says, you know, depending on the community that you live, depending on your household size, if your income is below this, we've decided that you are officially poor. It's progress, believe it or not. So because for the longest time, we had to have bun fights about who was actually poor and not. Inequality, right. on the other hand. Does refers, it mean I can forget this Lyco thing? Do I, can I forget Lyco yeah. now? Oh, yeah. Forget yeah. Lyco. Yeah. It stopped actually okay. working about 15 years ago. <laughs> well, 10, 10 years ago. Like, it doesn't measure anything anymore. It measures, like, <laughs> you know, some share of consumption from circa 2002 or something. Anyway, yeah, forget LICO. Um, so inequality, on the other hand, um, is more about uh, the distribution of resources and, uh, and opportunities. So if you think about one as being an absolute problem, right? People absolutely do not have enough to live on, whereas the other one is a relative problem, which is what kind of society do we have in terms of levels of inclusion? What kinds of society, uh, what kind of society do we have in terms of the distribution of fair opportunity? So that's, those are the two issues there. And we have both. We do have both, right? Yeah. Uh, not as pronounced as some other jurisdictions, for sure. Like we do not have the same uh, mis or maldistribution of income and wealth that a country like the United States has. But we still have enough inequality that I think it's important for us to be paying attention to that. And um, inequality, what does one do about that? Isn't that basically a, fee you know, there's there's people out there uh, like to say things are features, not bugs of a system. Isn't inequality a feature of capitalism, not a bug of it? Isn't that the very core idea that we all have different abilities and we all work to different levels and we all are entitled to different rewards? Why is inequality a problem? Right. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so when people talk about reducing inequality or addressing it, Nobody is talking about ensuring that everybody has the exact same level of resources. I think what we're talking about, though, is recognizing, and there's, you know, there's some decent research on this, that inequality that is too extreme um, actually has broader social costs, right? There are negative externalities that when you have pronounced inequality, you get you get bad things like worse outcomes in terms of education systems, worse outcomes in terms of health systems, worse outcomes in terms of labor markets, and that those in turn actually have bad effects for all of us. Also, if we're in a world where, and this was true pre-COVID, it'll be true after COVID, where we have a declining share of our population that is of working age that needs to support a rapidly aging population, right? then doesn't it just make good like economic sense? Doesn't it just make good uh, competitive sense for us to want as many people in our country who are of working age uh, to have opportunities for good work and decent income? Uh, and that comes back to how we structure our labor markets, but it also comes back to uh, opportunities through education, right? Because that's, that's a huge equalizer. So it's, to my mind, it's, uh, it's avoiding, in, addressing inequality is about avoiding the negative consequences of inequality that can affect all of us. And it's also about recognizing that it's, frankly, it's wasteful. It is wasteful in a country to um, allow people to not fully participate when we are already facing those kinds of labor market uh, constraints. Okay, let me let me put, make it a little bit more sharply political, which is how I tend to think about it. Which is <laughs> that in in the twenty fifteen election, the collapsing middle class, the declining middle class, was fundamental to the liberal message. 
Um, and their programs were not pitched as poverty reduction programs. Their programs were pitched as middle class buttressing programs. In the last federal election, everybody was scrambling to address middle class affordability issues, that the middle class is feeling financially stressed. Mm-hmm. Are you concerned? Is that an issue in Canada or is that a bogus issue in Canada? Are you concerned about poverty or are you concerned about the declining middle class in Canada? My first concern is about poverty and inequality and the degree to which we allow uh, people who uh, are living in poverty to languish and essentially not have opportunities for upward mobility, right? So that's my primary concern. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the middle class stuff, okay. So liberals come in in 2015 with that as their kind of central plank, which I'm pretty sure they lifted uh, directly from Obama uh, circa, what, 2012? I think he had his, you know, middle class economics works uh, theme. Mm-hmm. There is some... Yeah, he wouldn't have invented it either, but... No, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. you can kind of trace the origin of the, <laughs> you know, of the dialogue. Yeah. Um, and, okay, yes. Uh, is there some evidence for stagnation? So it's not necessarily declines, right? But it's stagnation of incomes in the middle, right? So we we saw some growth at the bottom end of the distribution in terms of income, largely due to tax and transfer policy. Uh, we saw some uh, some pretty big increases, frankly, at the top end of the distribution. Again, in part due to tax and transfer policy doing less redistribution than it used to. In part due to, for example, fancy tax planning that lets rich people uh, incorporate in order to pay a lower tax rate um, and shelter large amounts of their assets that way. Um, and so relative to those two ends of the distribution, the middle class had not necessarily been moving. Add to that, that any real growth that we have seen in household incomes um, has really largely been in the, like sort of in the last 20, 30 years has really largely been driven by women coming into the workforce and making wage gains we seem to have run out of steam on that, right? Like as many women as we're going to come in and as much wage growth as we were going to get under that old system and that old way of doing things, we got it, right? So we squeezed out all that juice. And so I think that there was a real concern around, okay, so where is the new growth going to come? How is the middle class actually going to feel like they're keeping up with uh, particularly the, the upper uh, income deciles? Um, and... <sighs> You know, is that right or wrong to focus on in terms of policy choice? I mean, it's a choice. My concern is more when governments make policy choices that are quite clearly good for the middle class and quite clearly clearly crappy for people who are not middle class but are part of that, um, what was the tagline, working hard to join it kind of piece, right? So I don't have an issue with policy that is inclusive of the folks who are working hard to join it. My concern is more when we focus only on the middle class and forget that there are still people in poverty. Would you agree that the rich are richer than they were 40 years ago? Are the rich richer than 40 years ago? Oh, Maybe, maybe they are. My, so my area is particularly in household wealth, and we don't actually even have 40 years of data. So I can't tell you. Well, 40 years ago, was it possible for somebody to get as rich as Jeff Bezos? Oh, like in terms of, oh, we're going like global? Yeah, no, no, no. no I mean, it would, have been inc- it would have been incredibly difficult for somebody uh, to attain the level of wealth of a Jeff Bezos. Right. So that level of affluence has exploded. How do we get yeah. it? They don't need it. Jeff Bezos couldn't even imagine what to do with that money. Right? It's true. And, if he and tried. incentives. You know, George Will was on this show and tried to talk to me about incentives. And I was like, come on, you're telling me that when he was working in his basement to invent Amazon, if you told Bezos, you know, the most you can only get, the most you can ever get out of this is $50 billion that he would have stopped and said, that's bullshit, right? Fuck this for 50 billion. No, I mean, it's crazy that you need $300 billion. Well, I don't know that anybody 
needs 300 billion for, you know, um, yeah. but if, if we're looking at defining need, but so I think that it, it's, um, okay. So this is actually a complicated question. There's the issue of Jeff Bezos's personal wealth, right? And does that in some way, shape or form need to be redistributed? And it's not just through incentives, right? Like it's not by giving him a generous tax credit for charitable donations, right? Or, or, you know, giving him favorable media coverage because he donated X amount. Um, So there's a question there around, do we have the right tax system that is actually doing an effective job of some of that redistribution that we had always expected it to do. There's that on the personal side. Then there's on the corporate side. We have a real challenge of figuring out how the hell, and this is not just a Canadian challenge, this is a global one, how the hell to treat and uh, tax and frankly regulate, or at least figure out whether we need to regulate uh, the Amazons, the Facebooks, the, you know, all of those new forms of, uh, of economic activity that essentially are dealing in intangibles. They're incredibly mobile. The United States has made absolutely clear that they view those as American companies that can only be taxed and regulated, if at all, in their jurisdiction in the States. Um, And this is going to be one of those, I mean, it was a big challenge before COVID. I imagine everybody has just agreed to down tools and come back to that question later on. But yeah, I mean, as, as more of our economy moves to that sort of level of, of this is a world of intangibles where you need to get transportation. There's an app for that, right? You need to get your house cleaned. You rely on another app, but none of the, none of the value of those apps necessarily for the corporate value of those apps necessarily resides here in Canada and yet a huge amount of our economic activity and labor frankly right as well are engaging with them and how do we how do we want to treat that both from a tax perspective but also thinking about how do we want to treat the people who are Canadians working on Canadian soil working for those firms because um you know I think about one of the impacts of COVID being pretty clearly, you know, when we're looking at where are the sectors where we're still seeing uh, outbreaks, right? It's often vulnerable workers who, for example, are working away in, in, um, uh, in places like Amazon warehouses, right? With minimal protections. And that worries me. Right. Just on a basic level, why do we tax working labor income higher than we tax month capital and wealth. Right. So like, isn't there just a, a, a crazy incentive in there right now um, that a working stiff who's making an income gets taxed at a higher level than capital gains, which are where all the wealth is accruing right now. I mean, the people that are making gains in our society are people that have money and the tax system encourages that, right? So, okay, in theory, in theory, right, um, a system that taxes only income or taxes only savings ought to actually be to work out to be equivalent, right? Because all money is either something that you made or something that you saved. And in theory, Canada has opted for a system of taxing income. And in theory, we say that if you are generating income off of capital, right? That ought to be given essentially the same parity as income that you've generated by working, right? Through labor. In practice, that's a different question, right? That's not exactly necessarily what is happening. There are some things that we have in our tax code in terms of the treatment of capital gains that are there deliberately to avoid double taxation, right? That if you made the money by working and then you saved it, Um, and it in turn generates some return that becomes part of your income, Um, we need to avoid a situation where we've actually taxed you twice on the same money. But it is a complex system that, frankly, I think most Canadians do not understand um, that works well for wealthy people in part uh, because they're the ones that that can afford the fanciest tax advice. 
And let me go further. I think that the problem is not just the treatment and the complexity of capital gains and how that interacts, for example, with, um, you know, rules around dividends and Canadian controlled private corporations and all the rest of it. Um, there's also just a fundamental thing in our tax system that the incentives that we do provide to people for saving money. So for example, if you put money in a TFSA, we don't give you a deduction, but we also don't tax that money uh, when you take it out or any money that you earn in it. Uh, with the RRSP, you know, hugely popular, wildly so, way more than policymakers ever would have thought when they put it in place. We actually give you a deduction, right? And I mean, I'm sure you remember a time that uh, interest rates were higher and banks were doing crazy things like saying, borrow money to put into your RSP, then take the deduction and use that to pay back your loan. Like, it's insane, right? Um, yeah. But all of those instruments are really largely well set up for um, not necessarily the top 1%, right? Because they, like, they have them, but they don't really need them. Like they have way more complex um, tax uh, advice that they're using and maximizing their capital gains and, and all the rest of it. Um, it's, it's a system that is well set up for, I would say, kind of the, the upper 80%, right? And it's really crappy for an awful lot of folks who are down at the bottom 20 or even bottom 40%. But it has this thin veneer of being universal, that anybody can get access to this support to build up capital and save a bit on taxes. Um, and it turns out that that is actually in practice not true. Right. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do a little bit of myth, myth busting. All right. Here. I'll do what um, I can. Because, because you are a social policy activist who does not seem to believe in some of the big ideas that are circulating around about fairness initiatives in our society. Wealth tax is one of them. So we've we've just been talking about wealth. Elizabeth Warren ran for the presidency of the United States on what was considered to be the best thought through platform that anybody has ever run for the presidency on. She had a plan for everything that she was prepared to hold up to scrutiny. And she was gonna pay for most of her initiatives with a 3% tax on wealth. Seemed pretty modest, seemed pretty affordable for the wealthy, seemed pretty painless for everybody else. Why can't we do that? And you don't think we should do that. I have concerns with it. So, okay, I'm, good. I'm like the Debbie Downer of this show today. I am the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm the person who comes on and says, well, I got some concerns with that. Um, uh, maybe that's just my role. Um, so here on the wealth tax issue. So I actually uh, read the background paper that um, by the academics that, that Warren uh, drew her plan from and the model that they came up with. And it's a model that looks really, really interesting on paper. But I always think about implementation and feasibility, right? Because the best designed policy on paper is just the best designed policy on paper. And it's not necessarily going to have the impacts that you hope for and expect when, when you put it into practice, unless you have thought through all of those issues around implementation and feasibility. And here's the biggest one um, that I think that we have. Or, well, here are, here's a short list. Put it that way. It's not the biggest one. <laughs> I've got too many to make it just one. Okay. Challenge number one right now. Um, we do not currently have systems in Canada that would allow for third-party verification of how much wealth somebody has, right? We're getting much, much better on compliance and third-party reporting with regards to income, including like some forms of self-employment income and whatnot. And that's really, really important for tax compliance and enforcement when you know that people have a really strong incentive to try and avoid a new tax, right? So uh, we, we would have to figure out that piece. So is that, you know, we make banks report on how much money you have in your bank account. Uh, how do we, how do we find your other money? How do we, fi I mean, we're still trying to struggle with how to catch people who are storing money off in the Cayman Islands and the Panama, you know, through the Panama papers and that kind of thing. So that's a non- negligible problem. Problem number two, who owns the asset, right? So um, right now um, in, in Canada, all of our data that we collect on wealth is at a household level, but we tax people individually. 
And so when it comes tax time to pay your 3% on your 10 million or whatever it is, who in the household actually pays that? So if I've, I've got three kids, let's, let's imagine somehow magically I have been given $10 million. Ooh, it's great. Um, if I, <laughs> yeah, right? I know it's an exciting day. It's, it's an exciting, exciting day. day. Let's, let's <laughs> knock off early. Who needs this show? <laughs> exactly. Well, <laughs> nice chatting. Um, so, so let's imagine that happens, but I've got three kids. And so if the threshold for the incidence of the taxes, you know, you've, you've put it at 10, 10 million. So I would mostly have to pay. If I now carve that up and give each of my kids some bucks, right? A million here, two million there. They can have a fight over who mom loves best by how many millions they each get. Um, now suddenly, I have reduced. I have lowered my personal liability. Now the Elizabeth Warren plan said basically, ah, tax them as a family unit, right? Um, that's like we just administratively. That is completely antithetical to how we run every other aspect of our tax system here in Canada. So that would also require um, huge rethinking. Um, and the other thing that's important, I think, to remember is that we don't have Jeff Bezos here in Canada, right? We have, we have some rich people. We have some rich people. Um, but our top 1% or top 0.1% by wealth, um, I, don't, I don't know if they would crack the, the top 10 even in, in the United States. So it's also just a question of, 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 a, of magnitude. Right. And any time that we are looking at other jurisdictions for policy ideas, I think it's a great exercise. I'm a big fan of comparative policy, um, but it's always important to remember whether or not we're not just importing the policy idea, but also the diagnosis of the policy problem from other jurisdictions. So there you go. Those are some of my three concerns with wealth taxes. You have described yourself at several points in this conversation as an incrementalist and Reading your, reading your work, I would agree that generally I had a whole list of things I wanted to get through here with you, but we're running out of time. But, you know, I've had people on like Jim Stanford and other people who, when I talk to them about things, talk about big fundamental structural changes. Your work tends to focus on tweaks nuances, how do we make this thing better, more targeted, more effective of what it's supposed to do? Is that your nature or is that your sense of what's doable? Maybe it's a bit of both. I mean, I am at heart, I think, just a practical person who wants to solve problems. And like I said before, great policy ideas that are ideas on paper, uh, they're not going to help people if they can't actually be made to work and function. And I think actually, you know, incrementalism is not necessarily antithetical to radical change. One's a process, the other one's an outcome, you know, right. and right. Like we have, um, we have actually done big things in this country, even if it has taken time. And uh, even if policy doesn't seem to move as fast as some people who are really impatient to see change would like. Um, and, you know, incrementalism isn't always the right way to go. Um, but I am a big fan of making sure that we can actually put in place the ideas that we want, that we know that they'll make a meaningful difference, that they'll work for the people that they're intended to reach. Um, and yeah, sometimes that means, uh, uh, you know, changes that might look small from the outside, but actually can have big impacts. Um, you, um, teach people how to be political assistants at the University of Carleton. You yourself were an exempt staffer in, uh, in the, the 1990s, I believe. And part of your program, which is such an excellent program at Carleton University, the School of Political Management, the Carleton School of Hackery and Flackery. Um <laughs> Um, you teach people how to be uh, political assistants, political advisors. We've talked about on this show uh, a number of times, especially through COVID, about the, what the role of political staff is versus what the role mm -hmm. of departmental staff is. What are the most important things that you try to teach people who want to work for a minister 
or want to advise somebody in politics. Yep. Um, and thank you for asking me about the program because it is something that I think is pretty cool. And um, um, if, you're, if your listeners are uh, listening, um, still accepting applications. Um, so uh, And hire people a, from this program. You won't go wrong. I've done it. You won't go wrong that's true. people out of this program. That's true. We do have, we do have fantastic students, and um, they go on to do really fantastic and interesting things uh, for uh, private sector folks, for governments of all political stripes. Um, so, yes, uh, I was a former political staffer, uh, you know, like 100 years ago, and so maybe teaching people now is like my penance for that time, right? Um, right. But, uh, look... I think the political staff are, for, uh, for better or for worse, they, they are engaged in a form of public service, right? Ministers need uh, a team of people that can uh, provide them with, uh, with supports and with advice that uh, a nonpartisan professional permanent public service just can't, right? They're just not equipped to do. So uh, my area of, of focus within the program is on public policy. And I would say that if you talk to most political staffers who end up in a policy job, that they uh, develop a rapid appreciation for uh, exactly how complicated making good public policy is. And you also have a choice as a political staffer, I think, around are you going to focus just on process, right? Are you going to focus just on making sure that the cabinet document uh, arrives on time that your minister can sign it, or are you actually going to engage with the substance, right? And be thinking about what are your minister's priorities, um, what's in your mandate letter that you need to advance. And it's, you know, derisively people will say, oh, that's just putting a political spin or a political lens on it. Uh, and actually, no, I think it's more than, much more than that, right? Political staff can actually play a uh, an important role, I think, in the public policy process. And unfortunately, there have also been times that political staff have ended up playing. It's been an important role, but not necessarily a constructive one, right? Like they end up being uh, creating roadblocks. They end up creating uh, conflict over public policy. Um, but it's a critical role. So I try to focus on having students gain an appreciation for um, the the nuances and the complexity that you can't just wave a magic wand and make it you know make it so um, that they can to some degree understand and speak some of the same language that the public servants will be coming at them with because for better or for worse a lot of public policy in this country is dominated by economics right and if if you're not necessarily conversant with some of the big ideas it's actually hard to I think do your job effectively. As a, as a policy advisor in a political office. And um, I would say another important thing is that students in the program come from a bunch of different political backgrounds, like literally every party that I can think of. Uh, we've, we've had a, a representative, um, at least sort of major national parties. Um, and I won't um, make you define that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one thing that I hope that students and that, that I certainly, I think my colleagues and I all try to emphasize this is that actually parties can uh, have quite a bit in common. And certainly you see that in the, in the, um, in the policy uh, space, right? So one of the things that we work on in, in my courses is getting an understanding that actually a number of different parties are actually all very interested in doing something good for the country. And, in many cases, they actually very much agree on what are the major challenges and problems. It's just disagreements over how we should move forward and move ahead. And reasonable people can and should disagree. And we can actually, though, find some common ground. Um, and it's been really great, actually, to see students from different partisan backgrounds engaging in a substantive, substantive policy discussion and debate and actually changing their minds on policy topics. So they come in kind of accepting the, the party line and they leave going, actually, maybe, maybe there is something to that idea over there. And I think that would be really positive for our country if we had more of that. Every time I've tried to explain what political staff do, exempt staff, ministerial staff do to ordinary people, they end up asking me why they're paying for that service. 
um, because it sounds to them like it's entirely in the interest and service of the political party for whom the minister belongs and to the minister's political career. Um, and it's what is the public interest in having ministerial staff? Simplest way that I can explain this is to say um, absent ministerial staff, right, who are going to look after some of those issues around um, thinking about the minister's mandate, paying attention to what's happening in the writing, uh, responding to constituency concerns, navigating and uh, negotiating that working relationship with, with PMO, with other ministers, reaching across the aisle, right? Um, if we don't have resources for political staff to do that, then ministers are going to turn to the nonpartisan public servants, and then we end up with a politicized public service. And that leads to bad things in terms of politicization of our, of our government. That leads to mistrust when you have a turnover in government, right? That, that a new government comes in and goes, oh, they're, you know, they're all just completely loyal to the previous guys. Uh, we can't trust them. And then you lose institutional um, uh, credibility. You lose institutional trust. And we actually would end up losing big capacity within our government. So, um, it's worth paying to have that function served. It's worth investing in training to make sure that the, the function is, is high performing. Um, and so, yeah, I believe actually that the program at Carleton serves a real public value. Terrific. Jennifer, we're out of time. This could go on forever. I've got whole sections of things we didn't even get to talk about. You're fascinating. Thank oh. you for coming on and sharing your insights with our with our listeners and the occasional viewer. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> Take right. care. Take Thank care. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Right. If we have learned anything over these past few weeks, it's that in times of crisis, governments matter. So if you've never heard of Queen's Park today, it's one of Ontario's most trusted news sources for political insiders and for people who actually need to know what's happening at the legislature every day. <clears throat> Whether it affects your business, your stakeholders, or the health and safety of your family, Queen's Park today is tracking the ongoing developments in Ontario. The newsletter lands in your inbox first thing every morning so you can start your day off already ahead of the game. The only way to get the detailed, boots-on-the-ground coverage you need is by subscribing to Queen's Park today. There's also BC Today and Alberta Today. To get a free two-week trial of Queen's Park Today, BC Today, or Alberta Today, go to politicstoday.news and hit the free trial button. That's politicstoday.news backslash free trial. All right, here we are. It's our weekly panel. Jenny, Scott. Jenny, something's different about Scott this week. What is it? It's his hair. It's the hair. <laughs> He's been hiding it under his cap for like the last month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's A shame no longer. I got game show hair. I got 1981 game show hair. I'm like Wink <laughs> fucking Martindale. Look at me. You look like a uh, you look like an extra from like the Facts of Life or one of those era of shows. Danger Bay. If we're going to be Canadian. Danger Bay. There we go. <laughs> Ocean. I remember her name was Ocean. I love that. <laughs> well, Jenny, you're a new person out there in Fenland Falls, outside, freed a, from the strictures of your condo. You are a new woman. I, it is amazing here. On Saturday, I went to uh, Bob Cage and went shopping, dropped a lot of money at Bigley's, doing a plug for Bigley's, and then went and <laughs> sat on a glorious patio where people were laughing and smiling and there were no masks, and it was, it was amazing. It was, I have never enjoyed sitting on a patio more than I did uh, on Saturday. Well, I have no hate in my heart for you. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off to you and your outside of Toronto slash Peel region party that you're having all day long, every day. Yeah, but people can yeah, drive Scott's to Yeah, Scott's going to move to People can drive to Scott's going to move to Halton just so we can have a beer. No kidding. <laughs> I, uh, I just did so grim. <laughs> <laughs> can't get my hair cut can't get a beer in a bar I suppose I could drive but then I'd be publicly shamed hey man are you from Toronto so Jennifer Robson she was super interesting uh, it was great to have her on the show I'm left though still uh, really feeling uh, in the dark about 
what I consider to be a pretty fundamental part of making public policy right now, which is if you don't have any idea what the limits are on your what you can afford, how are you making choices and how are you making decisions? The for instance, we're coming up to the the end of the the CERB eligibility for many people, and so now the government's announced it's going to be extending the CERB. What are the financial assumptions behind that on what's affordable? How long is the CERB affordable? And Jennifer said we don't really know what our new fiscal anchor is. Uh, she didn't give me a percentage of GDP for debt. She didn't give me an absolute deficit number, nothing. How do you operate in that environment, you guys? Well, I, 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 I don't think you really can. Uh, unfortunately, though, that's what governments are, governments are doing. And so there's, there's a lot of decisions that are, that are being made now. And I think people were, uh, people were willing to give a bit of leeway, especially over the last three months. I actually think the initial CERB program, I've said this before, was uh, uh, probably the, the, uh, uh, the best executed program that the federal government did, much so better than wage subsidies or the, the, rent, uh, the rent program. Uh, I think the only complaint I had would be they should have, you know, maybe given everybody 18 and over 2000 bucks and then they could have figured out more of a way so there wouldn't be, be fraud. But I, I think that right now they're making decisions uh, to extend programs. And uh, based on uh, anything we've seen, there's been no actual thought given to how this is going to affect our our economy uh, in the next several uh, in the next several years, and the only comment the prime minister has made is, "Well, interest rates are low, so things are great." That's you know they're they're low now; they may not stay that way. Right. But he's not wrong, and you know I think the, my takeaway from Jennifer Robson is that if you think someone has the answer, you're wrong uh, because the, it doesn't exist. And so there is no anchor. Uh, people are being guided solely by I must deal with the problem that confronts me because it's urgent and expansive. So I'll extend the serve because I don't know what else to do, um, and then the deficit balloons. And I think we have to be honest that, I mean, that a large deficit may be a reality for two, three years, again, because we have no real line of sight as to what's going to happen. We don't know if there's going to be a fall resurgence. We don't know if there's going to be a long trail before um, whole portions of our economy. And I mean long trail, I mean like two years, three years. Um, so I think we're going to continue to pile up debt. And then I, what I heard Jennifer saying was basically, as long as we can borrow at an affordable rate, uh, then I guess uh, we will do so. And that isn't just Canada's problem, uh, or that isn't just Canada's situation. That's the situation of governments around the world. And so I, I, I've said this before, but it seems to me one of the discussions that has to happen is probably through the G20 as a mechanism, but somewhere internationally, central banks and finance ministers have to come together and say, what's our collective take? on a massive compilation of debt, sovereign debt, country by country by country, and we're all lending to one another, and how do we ensure that going forward rates won't skyrocket, and then every single one of us will find that we can't pay the dinner bill. Um, and I, I think that's a discussion that has to happen. I think we need a collective. Yeah, that level forward. of international cooperation seems inconceivable at this point. It, it is inconceivable at this point. But the only thing I would say is that, you know, and you and I have had this conversation with our old boss, Paul Martin. Uh, you know, Mr. Martin was really essentially the founder of the G20, he and Gordon Brown. And no one wanted to use the G20, right? Those that, the, the, there are lots of people that said, you know what, I prefer the UN because I got a louder voice there. There were lots who said, I prefer the G7 because it's, it's a smaller club. It wasn't until the 2009 fi financial crisis that George Bush and the Americans said, we have to use the G20. It's, it's the appropriate mechanism for us to have the discussion and paint the way forward. We can't get that done right now. I think this is going to happen next year when the Saudis aren't the chair of the G20, when Trump hopefully to hope to God is no longer president and America is willing to assert its uh, its uh, role of leadership on the world stage. And I think that's when we'll have to have this discussion in earnest. Uh, but the G20 is going to have to be the mechanism for it because the G7 is too small and any other multilateral institution is too all encompassing. So this week, Aaron O'Toole released his platform. There's a number of things that we can talk about on this platform, but relevant to this discussion that we're having, he pledged a return to balanced budgets. If we're going to have a um, 
$250 billion deficit this year or a $300 billion deficit this year, then balance looks pretty far away. And it seems, A, like a hugely ambitious goal and one with which he was politically correctly unprepared to put any measures beside um, whatsoever. I, I, you know, I mean, I, I, again, I understand the uh, need to appeal to uh, to the members, and for him, if he's coming from behind, nothing could be more important to, than that. So I'm not second guessing him tactically at the moment, but I do think that a program of balance, returning to balanced budgets, is going to imply a set of draconian policies that will be politically unacceptable. Well, listen, I I could go on about. Uh Politic, how politically, um, uh, you know, whether releasing a 50 page platform for a leadership con- race, we can we can get to there. Um, I think the, the problem is, is, is if you're going to release a platform and p- political parties have learned this the hard way we did. And uh, we've talked about it on the pod before, uh, is that if you're going to talk, if you're going to go into specifics, you actually need to be able to back back that up. And one of the things that you guys did to us both in 04 and 06 is we released platforms in 04 with almost no costing, internal costing, and you guys jumped on that and it and it really hurt. In 2006, we did do costing and, and we've talked about it before. Um, uh, the Conference Board of Canada uh, costed it, but then backed away from actual doing any defense of the numbers after you guys uh, attacked us. And so I think if you're going to put that out, you have to have specifics. Now, to be fair to Aaron, in terms of that, it seems the government doesn't even have specifics. So uh, if they're going to be, if we're going to be leading into an election campaign, there are going to have to be some specifics, and there is no, ch- there is no worldly possibility that the Liberals can run another election uh, where they're not cutting spending somewhere. And in some ways, they're prepositioning it already. I believe it was Mary, Mary Ying and and someone else uh, that were on a Zoom call a month ago, where they actually even. Uh, alluded to making cuts in the uh, in the public service, which is a huge hot button issue in in Ottawa, as uh, uh, as you know. So um, uh, we can get onto the platform stuff, but I think that uh, uh, I think that uh, it's it's not going to matter unless uh, it's not going to really matter unless he uh, unless he wins. Uh, I think it. I think there's a, a couple of things though that are intriguing about it. I mean, first of all, it's. It's such patent bullshit, okay? So his statement exactly, like just be like, like let's just get real for half a second. The whole idea is he's trying to position himself as a straight talking guy who isn't gonna, isn't gonna snow everybody. He's gonna t- face up to the real problems. We're gonna deal with China and we're gonna deal with all the things that Trudeau isn't. I'm gonna deal with the stuff that Peter McKay doesn't have the balls to tell you. And then he says he's gonna cut the deficit to zero without raising taxes by finding program reallocation. Well. Fuck off. That is just like, I mean, I'm going to tie balloons to my ass, float across the country and shower their uh, people with lies. It's just garbage. Okay, so. But his platform, actually, that's why they're they specifically his campaign had to come out and say he wasn't going to raise taxes because his platform, the first uh, the first bit of reporting on his platform uh, actually read like he was looking at taxes. He's, you know, we're going to have to uh, look at spending and taxes. And and to me, as a conservative, I re- when I read the first, you know, National Post article on it, it was like, huh, that sounds like he's thinking about raising taxes. Okay. <laughs> so it's like, oh, I can't. I can't tell people that I'm going to raise taxes, so I vowed all, and I can't say that I'm going to cut subsidies to the oil patch, and I can't say uh, that you know I'm going to uh, rob anybody of any particular benefit that I have. But I will say that I'm going to balance the budget, and I'm the only person that takes it seriously. Okay. Well, and to be fair, well, wait a second. His most important his most important endorsement in the race is Jason Kenney, who has gone out of his way to be supportive of Aaron O'Toole. Uh, in the face of a likely victory by Peter McKay, and then the uh, fucking O'Toole comes along and uh, and says he's going to eliminate subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, which I presume he got a, a, a an abrupt call from Jason Kenney, and they changed their policy, they changed the platform pretty dramatically. But that's like, how the fuck did that get in there? Listen, to be fair though. There, what's also in there is building a deep water port in Churchill, Manitoba, and that's very compelling to the members leading into this uh, leadership race. Okay, so well, especially to what the people I think of Churchill is- who've had a deep, <laughs> who have a deep water port, they just can't get a fucking train to take anything to or from it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> but- 
isn't the interesting thing that O'Toole and his campaign think that the membership of the Conservative Party wants to hear this? That like that they think that if they want to position themselves as the serious policy candidates, which is I think kind of what he's trying to do, um, that it's a loser um, positioning from the get go. Absolutely, but that he feels that it's therefore obligatory um, in speaking to the membership to talk about uh, eliminating the deficit. And I just think that's an interesting. I don't know if you think that's right, Jenny, but I think that's an interesting. I think that's an interesting insight because it tells you where the headspace of uh, the conservative voting base, at least, is like the conservative membership base is, and um, and I, like if that's true, uh, then a new leader is going to have to reorient those people around reality because if that's the if that's a platform you carry into the next election, um, you know, uh, it'll make Andrew Shear's uh, campaign look like a, a rose garden. I think the conservative membership is, uh, I, I think that it's it's too simplistic to say that the conservative membership uh, supports uh, uh, balanced budgets. We, you know, we were during the economic crisis, we did run deficits um, and that was widely acceptable. I think that right now the conservative members uh, uh, completely understand the entire world change. That being said, fiscal responsibility is still, uh, is still very core and important. And I think that's what he was trying to uh, trying to get at void of being really able to talk about where the world is going to be in the next uh, in the next year. I think ultimately, and I, I thought it was very strange to put out the platform. To be honest, it I feel like it was almost like you know the uh, the spin by the chattering class and certain members of the media that you know Aaron is uh, you know uh, far superior a policy mind than than Peter. It kind of they fed into that and they're like, you want to know something? I am fucking smarter and I'm going to launch a, a 50 page platform, uh, even though you've sold uh, you've sold uh, tens of thousands of memberships more than me. And you're going to get those people out. I'm going to show, you know, Andrew Coyne just how smart I am. It's it's a fucking loser positioning in a leadership. Anybody that's ever made their weightiness on policy or their superiority on policy, the focus of their leadership campaign was A, already losing when they did that, and B, lost worse because of that. That's not what leadership campaigns are about. And, and Aaron O'Toole would not win because he convinced people that he had a smarter policy on this, that, or the other thing. If he's going to win the leadership, he'd have to convince the membership that he's more likely to win an election. That's what leadership campaigns are about. Of course. Well, that, and how many, how many memberships you've sold, and then you get those people out to vote. So, yeah. um, you know, so we'll see how the debate goes. Um, uh, we'll see how the debates go. Um, I'm on TV for uh, for both. You're nights. obligated to watch it, right? You're contractually obligated what? to watch it with through the CTV network. I, I'm doing uh, I'm doing two networks uh, for uh, for the debates. Um, uh, I'm not contractually obligated, but I I will uh, I will watch. Them. I'll be honest. I'm not sure if I wasn't doing TV, I I'd, I'd be watching them myself. <laughs> Well, I'm sure because I'm also doing CTV both nights, um, and I got to tell you, uh, uh, even though I'm covering them live, um, I have not yet completely decided I intend to watch the debates. I may just do the commentary <laughs> line. I think I'll get it. Honestly, I think I'll get it like ninety percent right. I'll, I'll send you my thoughts to the Hurley Burley uh, WhatsApp group we have. It's. Uh, you know, what can you say? But you know, your point, though, David, is really important. Like, no, there's always that sort of it's usually the third place candidate in the leadership, you know, that comes forward and says, well, here's Although like, in 1990 oh. it was fucking us. In 1990, it was us. We were the losers. And that's right. About policy in 1990. We were right. Oh, who has the most robust uh, uh, <laughs> policy on, uh, you know, whatever. And what, what it wasn't even Kyoto at that point. What, what remember we were. Um, what was the. Remember the convention. Well, Beach was the Meech no, was well, the Meech big was issue. The, yeah, but, but what were you talking about? Like what are you talking about? or something? Yeah, no, it was like the the origins of uh, green policy. Like there was uh, God, I can't remember. Anyway, this is just brutal. Uh, so, this so, highlights this conversation highlights why talking policy and leadership is ultimately futile. So. And so, at the end of the day, it's memberships. I think uh, there was a story out uh, late last night uh, in terms of. Uh, of Aaron doing um, uh, a conference call with social conservatives from Quebec and talking about uh, the liberals con 
conversion therapy uh, bill and, and I don't know, talking about priests speaking to their flock. Um, I, I think that uh, I think campaigns have to be very careful in, uh, in, uh, in, in how they they comment on that. So I think that will be a focus of the debate. I think in uh, in uh, Quebec or for the French debate tomorrow night, I think uh, we'll obviously see supply management because our members just seem still obsessed with milk. Um, you're probably going to see some pipeline stuff. I know in the past, uh, uh, Aaron's been, uh, Aaron's been very vocal about, uh, um, he's, he's commented before about using the, not with the federal, notwithstanding clause, uh, to build a pipeline through Quebec, which of course, uh, uh, uh even conservatives in Quebec, more conservative minded politicians like Francois Legault, uh, was very, very firm with Jason Kenney a year ago when they, when Jason was first, uh, was first elected. So I think it'll be, it might be the, the French debate, just like, uh, just like uh, the last uh, set of uh, debates for the federal election might be the more interesting one. What is it with conservatives and conversion therapy? Like, why can't people figure out that that is an issue to stay the Christ away from? What makes people go back to it and go, let's let's talk a little bit more. Like, I'm not, um, I'm obviously not for it, but I mean, I don't want to see priests in prison, and therefore, I'm going to try to tell you something you want to hear. Just stay away from it, man. Just stay away from it. It's pure electricity. If you touch it, you will burn. Scott, 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 you are forgetting. You are forgetting what people will do to win leadership races and what kind of compromises they'll make. And may I remind you that we were prepared in 1990, had it been relevant, to talk to Tom Wapel about votes. Because if there's 300 votes around there, you got to find them. And that's all Aaron O'Toole is doing. He's losing. He's got to find votes wherever he can find them. I, I actually, I, I won the delegate selection meeting in Kingston, the islands and Queens based on Tom Lapel, because even though we were saying, well, maybe you need to keep a vehicle open to him. The only way I could sign up members from the campus in the Kingston and Islands riding was to tell them that Tom Lapel and the pro-lifers had come and were going to take over the riding. Therefore, I needed them to sign up, take over the riding, and then we would elect a Martin delegate slate. And uh, and we managed to do that. But um, so I, I used Lapel to our advantage in that sense. But you're right. people, And then the p funny part is the candidates will convince themselves Themselves, that the horrifying uh, anti-intellectual contortion that they've twisted themselves into is is valid. And that's the funnest part, right? They'll be sitting in a room rationalizing it, and you have to listen to them, you know, go through that process of, of convincing themselves that they're not just selling their soul. Um, it's uh, often quite hysterical. Yeah, and I also think that there's, uh, I actually think that, uh, you know, we've spoken about this before. There, the social conservatives within our party are a very vital part of our, our, uh, our coalition. Uh, but to to say that they're you know single or one issue candidates, I don't think for the vast majority of social conservatives within our party, it's it's not fair. They also care about taxes and the economy and law and order, and I think you've seen that. That's why over the last two to three weeks, you've seen a real insurgence of uh, support uh, going towards uh, Leslyn Lewis. She's very uh, very smart, very common sense, and I've had a lot of people who had told me months ago they were voting for. Uh, uh, for different candidates who are saying, I think I'm going to vote for, uh, I think I'm going to vote for, uh, for Leslin. And I think she is, uh, I think she's doing a great job. Her campaign's run by a guy named Steve Outhouse, uh, who worked for us in uh, government. One of the first people I helped, uh, I interviewed and helped hire when we formed government in 2006. And I think he's done a fantastic job. So I was going to ask you about that, Jenny. She does seem to have something going. I see that I, I see some metrics like Google mentions are way up for her, yeah. which is a genuine sign of interest of things yeah. going on. What what is she doing that is capturing people's attention? Well, I think that she's not. Uh, I think that she is communicating what members uh, want to hear, and she's not getting mired up in the. Uh, in the politics. There's a lot of back and forth between Peter and Aaron and their campaigns. And I think that she's just kind of, she's been flying below the radar. She's not uh, getting into uh, unnecessary pissing matches uh, with, uh, with people. And she's just communicating what she, uh, uh, what she, um, uh, where, what she, uh, what she believes and, and selling memberships. Like, so we'll, we'll see the, the ballots go out on July the 2nd. That's when, uh, that's when candidates get the, uh, the final membership list. So we'll see, We'll kind of see how where the chips fall, um, uh, where the chips fall then. Can I say a rare, pleasant thing about Peter McKay? 
or somewhat complimentary um, comment because I haven't had an opportunity to say very many complimentary things about McKay over the last number of months because he's just been a walking emergency. But um, I, I think that in the last two, three weeks, um, he's been relatively shrewd. I assume that his campaign knows their membership totals. I assume they feel very confident about where this is headed. And so as all this O'Toole stuff is happening, he hasn't been engaging. He hasn't been playing to too narrow of a base. You've seen him do a couple of very like soft, uh, kind of almost personal positioning videos that he's released on social media. This is what I care about. These are the things we're gonna have to reflect on. Very high level, very like get to know me. Um, and he's avoided any of those sticky spider webs around all those kind of hardcore issues. I assume all of that is because he feels he has the luxury as a front runner that he can start to kind of broaden out. Um, but I think that's smart. Um, I think rather than, you know, getting panicky, watching a tool make news and go, oh gosh, what if he's picking up support among SOCONs in Quebec and knew I need to do something like that? Um, because boy, after the experience of uh, uh, of the last couple of years uh, under uh, Shear, I really think the party's going to have to uh, widen its appeal. And if I was McKay and I felt like I had a leader, a front reader spot, uh, front runner spot. I, I'd be doing exactly what he's doing right now, which is starting to think ahead without taking anything for granted, but starting to think ahead about trying to look a little broader than the party has looked for the last couple of years. You know, if you want to broaden the party, the best news that they could have would be a successful campaign and the emergence uh, of a star in, in Lewis. Um, yeah. Because uh, she may, you know, she's not going to win because she doesn't have the membership sales, but she could emerge as the star of the race and she could emerge with a much higher profile in the conservative politics than she's had to date. And, you know, that kind of person kind of upsets the apple cart and how people think about conservatives a little bit. Um, so that would be, I think, a silver lining in this whole leadership race for them. But go back to the debates. You two have to watch the debates this week. Should mm. anybody else... Has one of these things in any context ever mattered? I say no. No, it's but it's. It, it, I I don't think. Listen, I go back to saying I don't think I have ever seen a campaign won because of a debate performance, but you can see campaigns lost because of something that's been said in debate. And God, let's hope that happens. I mean, I'm just praying, <laughs> watching these things on Wednesday and Thursday evening. I'm just hoping that somebody says something so spectacularly bad that they burst into flames on stage. And then when they come back out to us, Jenny, and they're like, my God, O'Toole seems to be rolling on the floor and he's charred and flaming. And what would you do in a situation like this, Jenny? Do you throw sand or water on it? Uh, like, that's the only God damned hope that this thing would be worth peeling your eyes open for. <laughs> so, David, oh, I take my you're goodness. not going to watch? Uh, no, I am not going to watch. I will, uh, if there's a clip worth watching, I'm sure it will come across my, uh, sure it will come across my attention. Um, so, the RCMP did not have a good week in Canada. Um, uh, I don't know why they decided, uh, in the midst of everything that was going on around the world as a result of George Floyd, that they were going to start to get rough with indigenous people in, uh, in Canada. Um, and then the head of the RCMP comes out and says that there's no systemic racism within the RCMP, a position that she's forced to reassess, uh, within, uh, within a day find it interesting what people see and what they don't see. So it's interesting to me that a person like her, who was appointed in part to directly address and fix the problems of sexism and misogyny within the RCMP, would then be so blind toward the failings of the institution in a very related uh, but similar area. But um, I mean, I think that my perspective would be that our situation between the police forces in Canada, including the RCMP and Indigenous people, is uh, not particularly better uh, than it is between police, police forces in the States and the black population. I, I don't know how to quite make the comparison because um, I think, you know, the 
circumstances are so different that, you know, I think our policing versus U.S. policing systems are pretty radically different. I think obviously there's a ma massive difference between the indigenous populations in Canada and the uh, black populations in, in the United States. So I don't know about the direct comparison, but I do know this. Uh, there's clearly a problem with policing uh, in indigenous communities and the way in which indigenous Canadians are 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 treated by uh, the police. And I mean, that's been on broad display this week. And, you know, it's always hard to like, you know, exactly evaluate individual circumstances, but, you know, uh, you can't, you can't deny the obvious. I mean, there's no reason uh, that that chief should have been pulled out of that vehicle and beat uh, senseless like that. Uh, you know, the, the, so, you know, from my perspective, um, it's interesting. I have some friends that are involved with the Toronto Police Service, and um, there's obviously lots of challenges there, and no one would deny it. But I think there's such a dedication and commitment and effort and continuous effort on de-escalation practices within the Toronto Police Service. Um, and I'm not certain, and, I, and there's still all kinds of problems, um, but I'm not certain that that same commitment uh, to de-escalation uh, has been incorporated and embraced uh, elsewhere. Because if de-escalation was the cornerstone of your policing approach, uh, we would not have had these, uh, you know, I'll just be the three incidences, the two, the two shootings and the, and, and the violence. Uh, you just wouldn't have them. Uh, none of those situations required that kind of escalation, doesn't seem to me. And, and there are techniques to say, let's take this from an eight to a four instead of going from an eight to a 10. And, um, so I think there's like just massive, massive, massive amounts of work. And I think if you're the leader of the organization, the institution, like the RCMP commissioner, um, recognizing systemic bias, uh, systemic racism and unconscious bias, I think that those are table stakes. I, I really do. And I'm not trying to be politically correct and all that. I just think that you got to recognize there isn't an institution in this country. Uh, that doesn't suffer from those uh, challenges, overt and implicit. And a failure to recognize that uh, leaves me wondering whether those people are in the right position. Because I, I think if that's not your headspace, then you're not identifying a problem. And if you're not identifying a problem, you ain't going to get to the fucking remedy. Yeah, I don't really have much to. Uh, I don't really have much to add. I think that uh, th there has obviously been a problem uh, within the RCMP in terms of de-escalation. We even saw it. Uh, you know, what was it, 15 years ago when uh, when uh, they uh, they killed um, Robert, Jus I think it was Robert, but Jakansky in the uh, Vancouver, uh, Vancouver uh, airport. So I, I agree that the, the RCMP and probably other police forces, uh, but uh, need to review, uh, review their policies. But I also think then uh, there's, you know, uh, fellow officers need to be more cognizant of this because I know there are some very good cops. We all know them. Um, and, uh, if, if there's problems with colleagues, uh, uh, the culture of protecting those, and that goes to the police unions too, that, that, that end up, um, uh, that end up, um, defending, uh, kind of the indefensible within the police force. That's how you continue with this, with, with this culture of being, I hate to say above the law, but that's, um, uh, but that's what it is. And so uh, I think that, you know, I, I know like my aunt was a was a, a police officer for many years. She's retired. She was actually in the second year that the OPP actually took uh, uh, took women. So, it, it she, you know, it was tough slugging uh, uh, for uh, uh, for her. But I think that culturally there's a whole not just at the senior level in terms of de-escalation. Culturally, there has to be changes within the uh, within the. Uh, uh, the lower ranks of the RCMP as well. Yeah, I mean, there's just got to be something that you do with how you recruit people and how you train people because the stories are too frequent and too common and um, and uh, there's a culture in there that whether it's toward women or toward Indigenous people is, you know, not not what you can have in a police force. And I, I agree with you that the, uh, Scott, that the commissioner... That's uh, Senator Lillian Dick called for her resignation yesterday, and I'm not 100 percent sure that's out of line. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I shrink. Uh, I, well, first of all, it's awkward for me to even have this conversation. I'm obviously, you know, um, like I'm as white as a bag of flour. My no, but isn't it is important for white people to have this? Isn't it important for white people to have this conversation? It, it sure is. I'm just, all I'm hesitating is that I don't want to be, 
I, I'm anxious about being declarative because I'm talking about borrowed experience. I'm not talking about an experience that I've actually had to live through. I mean, you know, but I just, I find it, I, I, I just think you can't be in a situation where you don't have by instinct the right answer to that question. And I think having to take a day to fix that answer um, is, is, is wildly troubling. Um, and uh, so I, you know, I don't know if she will resign, probably not, but um, boy, it's, uh, it, it's, it's the worst possible signal at the worst possible time. Yeah. All right, so you guys are doing the debate, the conservative debates on um, uh, this week, but I think after it's over, you'll both have time to dip down to Tulsa for the Trump rally. Um, <laughs> have, you signed your, have you signed your waivers yet? Have you signed your I want coronavirus waiver? <laughs> yeah. Can you believe he's doing uh, this? Can you believe he's doing Let's just wail on him for a bit. And maybe Jenny will join us because she's in an anti-Trump mood these uh, these past couple of weeks. He's no, holding I'm just, a fucking I'm rally. I'm just, I'm just objective. You guys are not. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference. Okay. <laughs> well... What can you say? What can you say? There is no bottom, as everyone makes the point uh, frequently about this guy. But you know the the you know we're watching the cases uh, blow up uh, in a bunch of states where we're witnessing reopening, and that bill is going to come due. Uh, so, how many more infections will occur? How many more uh, hospitalizations and deaths does that lead to? We've talked about how fundamental the stat around hospitalization is, and we're seeing hospitalizations starting to increase up to 70, 80 percent in some of those states, and so. Um, so some of those nightmares are starting to come true. And the signal that the president of the United States gives in the midst of all of that is that that is not his priority. And that if you're over 75 years old, you are not his priority. You are future boneyard material as far as he's concerned. And, you know, what's he do? He likes to jack off at rallies. He likes to stand. He doesn't do the daily press conferences. We're going brutal for him. That was his wank fest where he would sit and talk about himself for a while. That's gone. So now he wants to get back to the rallies, his other favorite instrument where he gets to... Uh, you know, just shower himself with adoration. And so he doesn't care what the consequences are. I'm not even sure it's a good political strategy for him. I think, you know, maybe he likes it because he'll drive news, but I, I, I think the spectacle of it is more likely to motivate those who loathe him than those who support him. Uh, I, I just, I, lots can change between now and November 3rd, but I genuinely think day by day, this guy is pursuing a strategy that is going to lead to a historic thumping. I think he's really setting himself up uh, for a rinsing of, uh, of, of fantastic proportions. And I sure as Christ hope it happens. Well, we'll see. They look more we'll politically desperate recently than they've looked before, I think. Uh, I th Listen, I think, as I said three weeks ago, I think he had a very bad week, probably the worst week of his presidency. Um, I I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm not sure he's still, he's still in that position. I think you, his campaign team has been very clear that uh, the reason there, if uh, if thousands and uh, and thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people can can congregate for rallies across the country uh, or protests across the country, they feel that they can uh, they can uh, uh, have uh, have rallies. And in terms of whether it's going to motivate the people that loathe him, I'm not sure how much more th those people can be motivated. Like they've been motivated to loathe him and to campaign against him uh, for the last five years way before he ever uh he ever became president so i think we'll have to see it the, the, his rally is on june 20th uh in uh, in tulsa a week uh uh a week yesterday it'll be monday so or t t whatever day that is um and uh so we'll see we'll ultimately see what happens i think though if the and and we touched on it a bit last week or the week before I think that if cities continue to have uh, problems with these autonomous zones where you're basically having blocks of, of lawlessness, um, uh, I think that uh, that could end up, w if, if that continues, um, uh, I think you could end up seeing that be an issue that uh, will actually help drive people uh, to Trump uh, leading into uh, the campaign in November. Yeah, the law and order Here's thing the cuts the, the very, you know, yes, you're right. There's a very real danger there that if the Democrats become seen as the party of lawlessness and chaos, that there's a, there becomes a huge vulnerability there. Scott, you were going to say something? Well, well I was going to, uh, just on that point, I think that handicap has been relatively uh, muted so far. Um, 
you know, I, for example, I think the marches, which have started to tail off, the, the marches have not turned out to be uh, wildly violent. And so that hasn't handed Trump uh, the ammo to work with that he needed in terms of polarizing um, and, and trying to uh, make law and order the, the driving issue. Um, and I'm not convinced that this, this autonomous zone, I mean, that's a perfect example of a, of a polarized and a divided America and a divided American media. You know, it's all that you can see on Fox News. You'd think that like, you know, you think it was a escape from New York for Christ's sake in Seattle, but you turn on any other news organization and, you know, it's, it's being treated very mildly. And I don't know, we can call it lawlessness. I'm not sure that there's a breakdown of law and order. I'm not sure that there's a breakdown of, of, um, of civil society in terms of people feeling under threat. Um, there's no police, so there's, there's no police stores like businesses in, 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 in these zones are essentially, uh, uh, essentially having to pay, uh, having to pay self-appointed uh, people that are like doing law and order within the, uh, within the zone. They're completely lawless. And so um, I'm not, I'm not sold on, on, on the threat of it. And I don't think politically the threat has become pronounced enough for him to really, um, to, to, to really uh, uh, leverage it in, in a substantial way. And he needs that. And then Biden has insulated himself by uh, coming out against defund the police, which I think was a real vulnerability. If they had allowed their party to kind of go 1972 ish, or Eugene McCarthy, I think they would have been in real trouble. And Biden has, I think, um, wisely tried to. Yeah, plug but you're that you're you're, you're you're right, Scott. But you're you're all, there's the Democratic Party is two parties now. There's the centrist, traditional, um, Democratic Party, for whom what he did was essential to get the votes of those centrists that they're competing for with the Republicans had to take that defund the police story off the table. The other half, though, of the Democratic Party has become very radicalized, has become very radicalized. And so the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party, the more that Trump forces Biden to say things like, I'm against defund the police, which become progressive uh, standards, um, maybe he's demotivating his own turnout. Maybe he is creating a fissure in his own, in his own support. There's a threat there that he has to worry about on the left. And it isn't necessarily sure. a candidacy, it's a just a turnout issue. But coalition maintenance is, is a, like probably the most fundamental test of any party candidate, right? Whether we're talking about in the U.S. or Canada, right? I mean, we all know this from our own political parties. Can you contain your crazies right? and, and, and not allow them to overwhelm? In 2004, right? Um, uh, Stephen Harper couldn't contain his crazies, right? They started breaking out in media and we were able to leverage that. And with that and a couple of other issues, we rallied a turnaround. In 2006, Stephen Harper was much more successful in disciplining and containing his crazies. And it gave him, uh, it gave him ingredients for an election success. And so I, I think, you know, the question for the modern Democratic Party is not whether or not it's two parties, for sure. The question is whether or not the more radical element of that party is willing to eat crow in order to um, achieve the great prize of stopping Donald Trump, which they're going to presumably look at as a historic threat. And it's when you get... It's, it's when the crazies, when the radical elements of your party say that, no, winning is not as important as, um, as making sure that this plank gets into our platform at the July convention. That's when things go south. That's what happened in 68. And I think, um, I think so far Biden suggests to me that he's, even though he's an avowed centrist and as you know, milk toast as it gets, I think he's having success. And largely the success is because Trump is so fucking historically awful and alarming. Um, that the radical elements of the party are saying, you know what, we'll knuckle under and do whatever it takes to stop it. That's what it seems like, but there's a risk there. For sure. Yeah. Um, Jenny, I've been, I've been watching, speaking of the states, watching these states that have opened up and uh, have resurgence of cases, some of them very dramatic resurgence of cases. You see some of the trend lines in some of the states, and they're just virtually straight up. It's not a curve. It's a straight up line. It made me wonder, given everything that we've talked about, about Canada and Ontario, it made me wonder, how are Canadians going to react if that were to happen here and the government had to step in and say, okay, everything's back to lockdown? Because I don't care what stage or phase the governments say we're in, it looks to me like people are now behaving how they want to behave. 
People are taking matters into their own hands and deciding what's safe for them, what kind of circle they're prepared to be involved in, how many people they're prepared to associate yep. with. So people are claiming that freedom back for themselves. What would happen if the government looked at the numbers and said, actually, everybody's got to get back into their house? They're not, they, there's zero chance people will accept that. Is that right, eh? There, there's well, some no, people, there's it no, depends, there's no depends chance. on the threat, doesn't it? Okay, but this is this, this, this second wave that everyone keeps talking about. The, the vast majority of cases are still in Quebec and Ontario, and they're predominantly in long-term care homes. There was another outbreak of seven homes yesterday uh, in Ontario, which I don't understand how it can be happening. Like, I actually don't, I, like, I don't understand. So something is not working of these rules the government has put in place. But if you look at other jurisdictions, which, you know, came out of their lockdown and never were actually locked down as much as us, there hasn't been a resurgence in cases. You look at Alberta, you look at... Um, you look at uh, BC, uh, New Brunswick, the vast majority of the cases in northern New Brunswick and Campbellton uh, that, that got covered are in one long-term uh, care facility, which, which I've said this numerous times. I'm not discounting it. I think it's, it's, it's terrible. But I think that people are to the point where, um, you know, they're responsible and mature and they can decide where they can go and who they can hang out with. I find it perplexing as to people that are sitting there going, well, I got to wait and see what like Justin Trudeau or Doug Ford says as to whether I can like go and visit my friends and family. Like it's just, it's nonsensical to me. So I don't see there any, there is 0% chance that people will accept a lockdown to the level that we had, uh, that we had in March, April and May. Well, when you're in government, one of the things you have to accept is that not necessarily everyone shares your view. And I, I think one of the things that's interesting is that there's a persistent level, according to public opinion polls, a persistent level of apprehension, even in Ontario where people are chomping, even on Toronto where people are chomping at the bit to open up, like I am too. Um, but there's still an apprehension about it. And I so um, it, it, and we're dealing with what-if territory, right? But I think it is an interesting question about what would happen if there was a resurgence and say like the numbers got alarming and the hospital uh, hospital and healthcare systems uh, were starting to get stressed in a way that, you know, objectively we're going, hmm, gosh, you know, they're starting to get into capacity and the government felt that it had to roll back. How many people would be accepting? What would happen if people weren't accepting? What would the government do as a, as a consequence if people are being defiant? Um, do you end up in a world where you're ticketing people, you're doing something more severe? So I just think that's an interesting world to muse about. I, I agree with you, Jenny. I know it's 100% theoretical right now, okay? So I'm not trying to pretend otherwise. Um, but it would be, it's going to be, if it were to happen, it would be a really interesting test of people's deference to government institutions. And I think if they tried to do it in Florida, they'd say, go fly a kite. I think if it happens in Ontario, there's a chance that a much larger portion of the population will say, well, Christ, if my aunt is going to die, I guess I got to like knuckle under. Okay, but this is the issue. It's not just... Uh, it's not just about like we can joke and, and it's not just about going into a store or sitting on a patio. The lockdown has also had consequences in the healthcare sector. On top of this, we are still in a position in Ontario where no elective surgeries are, are continuing or are, are happening. Like there is a massive backlog and it's not just cancer and heart surgeries that we've talked about. But if you're sitting and you've been waiting for a new knee or a new hip and you're in constant pain or you need a hernia operation, how, like how can we go back to a position where we're completely locking down? We already have a backlog and people's health is, uh, sure. is generally suffering. And there has been no evidence of massive second waves. Uh, uh, states like Texas uh, and Arizona have been have been hit. Um, uh, Florida is the cases are up because they've actually like been doing massive testing, which they weren't. That's a what do you think about that? that what that, do you think about that California? What, what do you think is. about? What do you think about that California trajectory? They okay, probably the, thought a few weeks ago that it was over in California. But 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 there was always going to be an increase in cases. That was never. It goes back to this debate we had. It was never about. It was never about whether the cases were going to increase. It was about the trajectory uh, and the and the and the hospitalization so i, I like for anyone to think like it, there is zero percent chance that the world can be shut down until there's a vaccine because there is a possibility there will not be a vaccine right not all viruses have vaccines but again, you're, you're arguing about whether or not it will happen. I'm just saying if it does happen, I think it's going to be an interesting laboratory experience in politics to identify and to see whether people say, all right, um, 
the somewhat invisible and abstract threat uh, that's triggered by these rising cases is severe enough that I am going to limit myself no matter how much I hate that. And I'm going to accept and defer to government. Or do people go, no. Or I assume what's most likely is you'll get a whole variety of responses and it'll start to splinter and you won't see the broad-based deference that you saw in March. And I think that's going to be interesting because that is goddamned hard so, if you're in government to manage. So Scott, you're willing to, you are going to base your life on the advice that Doug Ford gives you at his daily press conferences. Jenny, I'm asking you to imagine a scenario and say, what happens? You're arguing about whether or not it's going to happen. Well, there's the same thing. We're having a theoretical mm. debate. It goes back to uh, you and I have vast different opinions as to how this was how this was handled and where we need to progress. And I am saying the world cannot shut down again. And no one else is no other country is going to do that in less than two weeks. Countries like Spain and Italy are reopening to tourists with no quarantine because they know they have to. Their economy cannot uh, cannot handle it. And I truly believe that the vast majority of Canadians don't fully comprehend how um, how horrible this has been on an economic perspective and that we will continue to feel those ramifications long, long after, uh, uh, you know, COVID becomes less of a day-to-day uh, -day topic as the virus I think you know, public reaction is going to be more complicated and more varied than you say. I, I don't think you're going to see a monolithic rejection, and right, hopefully it won't you know, come Jenny, to pass. You know, Jenny, you've you you for, you've forgotten that Scott has a lot more confidence in Doug than you or I do, um, and has developed a close relationship over time. So he is going to take the personal advice about Doug from Doug Ford about what he's going to do. Listen, I hope since that he's one of those nodding his tie, I'm on, I'm all in. You know. I hope that one of those pieces of advice Doug Ford gives you is to cut your hair. And I, even with my fucking hair, I'm still going to say, you know, I don't think that works for you, that lid that you're wearing right now. <laughs> I'm, uh, I hope this, we, I, I hope we're, I hope we're ending soon because I've actually, I got to take it for a walk. I got to, if I don't let it off at least twice a day, it just gets rangy. So, hey, hey, Jenny, if that was a chinchilla, what would it be called? Oh, Jesus, I don't know. <laughs> I always feel like that's a dirty joke, isn't it? I don't know where we're going there. I'm not sure. It's a... All right, everybody. Thank you. It was great visiting with you. Love you as always. See you next week. Bye-bye. See you guys. Bye.